This party is insane. We're supposed to be a lawful good slash neutral party. We learned that some bandits might be in the local tavern. Did we calmly enter and start asking around? N nope. We throw thunderstones and flocking flashbang the tavern and burst through the doors and windows. Throw down your weapons and get down on the ground or we assume you're hostile! My cleric is standing behind the rest of the party, just shaking her head and trying to diplomatically calm the mass panic before someone dies. So we have the SWAT team flashbang the area, swarm in, and start shouting orders. Then we have the calm negotiator trying to defuse this insanity. We disarmed a few patrons before one fought and got murdered horribly. Half the patrons then decided to flee upon seeing this. So the alchemists started throwing firebombs after them, killing them all. Ah uh, yes, I imagine the scrying stones your party was required to carry during a raid mysteriously deactivated from a freak null magic field. Weird how that always seems to happen, huh. But at least justice will be served when your party faces the judgment of the townsfolk in the form of paid administrative leave. My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to the Crow's Perch, where I descend into the whirling abyss of forbidden knowledge to obtain the forgotten story safeguarded by the valiant neckbearded knights of Reddit. One shots. Would you as a game master are forced to run because your players refuse to learn the rules of all the other cool indie games that, even combined, only make up for a fraction of the pages of 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons between the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and Be Sherry. <laughs> yeah, one-shots. Typically only a single or a few sessions, where you can put the players in situations that would otherwise be untenable in a normal game. One-shots are also spectacular for horror games, as high lethality, combined with spooky, over-leveled monsters, forces the players to consider fleeing, over-mashing the attack button until they eventually win. And what better game to run a classic horror one-shot in than one based on Call of Cthulhu? Spooky, world-ending monsters from the unknown cosmos, more tentacles than that film you click off of whenever your girlfriend asks if she could use your computer for a second? What could possibly go wrong? Aside from you forgetting to delete your search history. Unfortunately for the DM of today's story, apparently a lot of things. So, without further ado, let's stare into the abyss and pray it doesn't stare back as we gather up a murder and dive into this story. This event occurred a number of years ago now, so some of the events might be slightly condensed for the sake of retelling, as well as I might be confusing who did what slightly. The events proper occurred in 2015 or 2016. During September, I had expressed interest in running a Call of Cthulhu-esque game, using the end of the world rules, as a Halloween event. I vaguely recall that the books came out recently and I was intrigued in running something with them. We had been playing Pathfinder and one of my homebrew games for the past few years, so something different was needed. My usual group of friends slash players were interested, but I had some interest from a few other folks that were friends of friends. I let everyone know what the game was going to be and what to expect. It took a few weeks, but we got the folks that wanted to play ironed out and got them the rules so they can look over things before the one-shot. Most everyone ignored reading the rules, but I expect that constantly. Ah, oh, the plight of a GM. Convince your players to actually read the rulebook, impossible challenge. But let's continue. I explained that the game is going to be using the standard character creation for the end of the world, which is making a version of themselves. I offer the option to allow them to make a character up instead. But it is turned down by everyone, since they thought it an interesting idea. I did a session zero to get things arranged, with two players not showing up. Get everyone else taken care of, but suggest showing up early to finish character creation on the day of the game. Set the meetup time of 10 o'clock Saturday, and we all agree to that schedule. We discuss food. But I make the mention that everyone should get something before the game, 
and we can order something later. So, to set the stage further, I should introduce the group for this story. We have the following people. GM, me. Singer, a sometimes annoying person slash player, but make note that he is not a bad person slash player. He does try a little too hard and overcomplicates things. Fat Man, an old friend who suffers from ADHD hard. He uses it as an excuse for some poor behavioral habits and trying to get out of things he doesn't want to do, but good guy for the most part. Leech. At the time of our story, he's a really close friend. He never did anything other than Pathfinder and wanted to try something else. Wallflower. Leech's friend. Nice guy. Never played any TTRPG in his life. Cat Piss. Okay, once again, a non-YouTube friendly name. Catness Cat Caterpie. Caterpie. Friend of Fat Man. He wanted to play D&D, but never got around to finding a group that would take him. Smelled of cat urine from the 7 or 12, I can't remember, cats his mother had. Saturday, 9:10 or so. I get to the store and begin prepping the back room that we were to play in. Takes about an hour to get everything I need set up and get my music playlist and ambient sound set to proper keybinds so I can call lightning over the background music at any time. Leech and Wallflower are the first to show about 10.15. They were late since Wallflower works third shift usually, so we didn't get up on time. No worries. I walk through things with Wallflower since he was one of the players that missed the session zero. 10.30 rolls around. Still no other players. I call Singer and get no answer, and leave a voicemail message. Call Fat Man, and he says he's on the way to pick up Caterpie and should be there in 20 minutes. 11 o'clock or so. Singer shows up with Chipotle, apologizing for being late. They were super busy, and he had been waiting in line for almost 40 minutes for his food. He gives me chips. I am placated, temporarily. 12.15. I call Fat Man. He says they are getting food, and will be on the way shortly. 12.45. I get a message saying they will be here soon. 1.10. Fat Man and Caterpie arrive. I don't let my frustrations get the best of me, and I say go over the rules with Caterpie since he was the other player to miss the session zero. He seemed to not care much about anything I was explaining, but was wanting to start the game since he had to work later. Which was odd, since I was told when we were planning that no one was working, and I could do an eight hour game session. He says it's not till later, so not to worry. I let it go, and decide to get to character creation. Okay, quick stop. I will be the first to admit I have missed a game because I didn't wake up on time or because I had something scheduled that I completely forgot about. Life happens. But don't act surprised when your friends are going to think you're a douchebag for a while. If you can, send a message. Let people know what's going on. And if you show up late, just be respectful and recognize that putting together a game isn't easy. But something tells me that Caterpie is anything but respectful. So, let's keep the murder going and dive back in. Character creation for this is a bit odd, so to summarize, you have three characteristic blocks. Physical, mental, and social. In each of these, you have an offensive and a defensive attribute. You have one in each attribute starting out. But you place points in your attributes, up to a max 5 points total in each attribute. When finished, players vote on if the numbers listed fit the avatar of yourself you are creating. For the most part, the players did well statting themselves. I could feel the numbers matched accurately enough, but Caterpie had other ideas. He intentionally sabotaged the vote several times, most prevalently against Singer. Singer's points were, in my humble opinion, the most accurate to himself. Caterpie made it clear that he wanted Singer's mental attributes to be zero. I got mad, but I told myself not to make a mountain out of a molehill just yet, and calmly told him that's not how this works, 
and to not antagonize another player, we finish up character creation, and it's already after 2 o'clock. I begin the game trying to set the mood. Their friend, me, inherited a house, and is moving in on Halloween, and wanted to invite them to spend it with him and celebrate. They take up my offer, and head down to Lovecraft County, Ohio. My little spin on the mythos, and my hatred for Ohio. I am an Ohioan, we all hate it here. To make it feel more grounded in reality, all but Caterpie is enthused by the bit of buildup as I have to rush them along, skipping several planned events since we started later than I wanted to. The whole time, Caterpie is talking over me to Fat Man, about Yu-Gi-Oh! and other things not relevant to the game. I ask him to try not to talk over me while I'm explaining things and save it for when we go on break. He gets huffy with me and quiets down for a while. They get out to get gas at the local small gas station, and while my avatar filled the tank and paid, they were free to explore and do whatever. Most went to the diner to get something to eat, and got to interact with the locals and the sheriff. Caterpie wanted to stay in the car. When I asked if that's what he wanted, he said, Yeah, sure. I try to do a few things for him, but he ignores what I put in front of him. I shrug and continue doing what I do best. After about 30 to 40 minutes of roleplaying or so, the players leave the diner and head to the town. I leave them be as my avatar goes to get the keys from the lawyer, allowing the player to then explore the town before they continue. Caterpie once again refuses to interact with anything, or anyone for that matter. I try again, to no avail, to give Caterpie something to latch onto. Singer, on the other hand, managed to find some missing persons flyers, showing that multiple teens and young adults have gone missing. Leech finds out from the local gossip that a deputy's wife is missing, and they think she left because she was having an affair. Wallflower meets some teenagers, and they talk about how they plan on doing a seance in the woods to see if the spirits in the forest know what happened to the missing teens. After about 25 minutes of roleplay and discovery, the players head out to the house. While I am explaining the house and the area around it, Caterpie once again interrupts. He was wanting to know when the game is going to start. I look confused for a moment and ask him to repeat himself. He says again, when is the game going to start? Leech chimes in, wondering what he's smoking. Caterpie explains that he was hoping to have been killing something by now. I retort that this was not that kind of game, and I explained that before. This is a horror mystery game. The unknown horror, the thing that lurks in the shadow that we are oblivious to. Not some hack and slash, shit will hit the fan, but not yet. Caterpie once again gets huffy, and settles back down. I continue, albeit a bit more flustered. They explore the house, as my avatar unpacks the truck. They notice things about the house that are... odd, but not anything outright malicious. Just the standard tropes for this type of game. Wallflower is really coming into the game at this point, and he uses his character to great effect, despite being a new player. While exploring the house, they find an old locked jewelry box with no key, that had writing on the lid, that when they looked it up on their phones, read something about holding back darkness, written in Latin. Caterpie, on the other hand, is trying to pry decorative swords off the wall of the study. When questioned why he wants to do that, he responds back with, For when GM tries to kill us. Once again, I am beyond upset with Caterpie, but I calm down enough to explain what metagaming is, and that it was bad, and he should not do it. At this point, he says he will just steal them. I groan once again, and ask him verbatim. So you are planning to steal some fake swords from your friend's new house? And not even looking away, he said, yes. All right, this is just beyond disrespectful. You're playing a game that seems to be revolving around the story and the characters desperately attempting to survive, as opposed to one filled with mythic heroes on a game board with initiative roles. You have mechanics in this game built around investigation, conversation, and survival. With that all in mind, 
Caterpie. What the hell did you think you were signing up for, after being told all this? This clearly isn't Pathfinder. This clearly isn't Dungeons & Dragons. You're trying to win the game, in a game about losing. Your mindset is antithetical to the one required for what you're playing. So this is gonna sound mean, but I gotta ask. What the hell are you even doing here? Maybe we get an answer, but I feel like we won't. So let's get back to the story. At that point, I call break so I can get some fresh air and calm down. It was about four o'clock when the suggestion was made to go on a food run. They want to go to the local drive-in and get some quick, cheap food. I'm not hungry at this point, and they head off together while I sit and relax. At some point, I guess I passed out, because I only remember coming to about 4.45, and they weren't back yet. I send a message to Fat Man and get no reply. I call Leech and get told they had to stop at Kroger and will be back soon. I sit there waiting until 6 o'clock. By now, I was furious as they walked in. Milkshakes, burgers, and a pie. And ice cream? I looked at them confused as they sat back down at the table. I questioned them about the pie, and Fat Man explains that they had this stand that was selling pies in the drive throughs parking lot, and they decided to get one. They then needed to get plastic silverware, so they then drove to Kroger on the opposite end of town, since they were closer to that one than the one back towards the store. They then end up buying other things, and forgot what time it was. So they quickly went to someone's house, I don't remember whose anymore, to reheat the pie, because no one likes a cold apple pie, and then came back. You went on a two hour pie break. Are you flocking kidding me? My disbelief was immeasurable. I was so filled with indignation that I almost walked out the door at that point. I was so done with everyone at the table, but Singer calmed me down. He, Wallflower, Leech, and Fat Man wanted to continue. Caterpie had other ideas. So against my better judgment, I continued. They have the first night in the home, and things get a bit weird as they hear unearthly howls in the night. Lucky for some, they are able to just go back to sleep and ignore it. Caterpie and Wallflower get affected and are basically unable to sleep peacefully, causing them issue come morning. Caterpie calls bullshit and grumbles about it, while Wallflower plays it up and talks about the howling last night with the other players. They decide to go back into town and check in with a local locksmith to see if he can open the box. Caterpie wants to stay behind, but thankfully the rest said no and forced him into coming along. I left my avatar back at the house, so I didn't infringe on their investigation into the box. While in town, Caterpie decides to sit down on a park bench and do nothing, while the others get the box open and see the contents within. Multiple letters from World War II talking about war profiteering, but also letters talking about a creature that chased them as they left France. The mystery was getting deeper. Most of my players invested more and more into what was happening. But then Caterpie says, Well, this has been boring. I need to get to work. I look at the clock, and it's only 7. I ask him what time does he have to be there. He tells me that he has to get home and get stuff done before work, like get a shower. Fat Man was his ride, so he had to take him back home. I put a pause on things at that point, and the rest of us, Fat Man included, mind you, decide that once Fat Man was back, we could continue. Fat Man takes Caterpie home and doesn't come back. I call him, but I go to voicemail. It's about 8 o'clock when we finally hear from him. Fat Man explains that he forgot and went home. At that point, I break. I was done. I was so mad that I started to angry cry. I apologized to Singer, Wallflower, and Leech for how bad things went, and that I basically failed them as a GM. They were upset as well, and wanted to continue. 
but I could not bring myself to do so. I packed up my things and talked with them a bit longer, called it a night, and drove home. Later, I would find out from Fat Man that Caterpie was happy about the game. It was strange, so I asked him what he meant. Fat Man would tell me that Caterpie was 100% wanting to flock my game up, so I would run something that he wanted to play in. He wanted to beat the GM, as it were, but since I wasn't giving him a means to do it in-game, he took it out of game. I told Fat Man that Caterpie is never invited to any games I run, and I will not participate in anything that he is invited to, under threat that I might toss Caterpie down a well if I see him. Obviously, a means of conveying my dislike of the man. But I wouldn't mind wringing his neck if I could have gotten away with it. Since then, I never ran another one-shot. Which is saying something. Since I had been running Halloween one-shots since about 2009 at that point. Looking back, I should have done so many things to try and fix the situation. But that's the benefit of hindsight. I should have put my foot down with Caterpie more than I did. I should have been more direct with him about his attitude. I should have just not let him play in the first place. I am no longer friends with Leech or Singer, and Fat Man is still a friend, but a distant one since moving out of state. I never found out what happened to Caterpie. Last I heard, he inherited money from a rich relative and bought a house, flaunting his new wealth in people's face. And Wallflower, I really have no idea. Since then, I have called this event the Pie Shot, as a means to laugh about it. However, I am still deeply salty about it. Every year I consider doing a Halloween game, but I can never get over the Pie Shot, and it kills my drive to do one. I guess bad games stick with you longer than the good ones do, sadly. Oh, Caterpie. Failing upwards, I see. <sighs> well, OP, you did try, and honestly, Every single one of your players is at fault here, especially for whatever the hell transpired when the group left the game for two hours to get food. If they were bored or uninterested, or if Caterpie just convinced them to rather play an action-y game instead, it doesn't matter. They needed to communicate this to you, instead of then convincing you that they were here to play a game, because at the end of the day, it didn't matter enough for them to show you basic human decency. I hope one day you consider running a horror one-shot again, and I hope Caterpie's house is filled with termites that have slowly begun to eat through the foundation. I hope he put all of his assets into NFTs right before the crash. And finally, I hope he never gets rid of that smell of cat urine, and that it stains him throughout his dating life for the rest of his days. And with that, thank you for listening to today's stories. And if you like today's stories and would like to see more of them, then please consider taking a slice out of that like button, or baking a whole pie out of that subscribe button. Made it this far? Why not leave a comment? Can't think of a comment? Then leave the comment, what's he cooking? So that way I know you made it to the end of today's video. And if you like the channel and want to support it financially, then you can either hit the join button or sign up on the Crow's Perch Patreon, link in the description. So that way you can join the Burb aristocracy, like our Counts of Quills, like Tekris, Raven, Aaron Kados, Critical Kunik, Evix, King Drazil, Christian Pip, Cosmosis, Rikus, Jaded Gale, Haley Thompson, Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. Or with only five dollars, you could become a Baron of Beaks, like Valison, Miss Tiger Beans, New Haven RP, Kieran Slater, Running Bear 2525, Ginger Ninja, Haley McAuliffe, Brittany Mars, Raytheon of the Nerd, Sarah Warren, Spectre Spark, Oz Turok, Ghost Legan, Mr. Hypocritical, Jesse Shodell, Kuntos Weasel, Tech Blog, Corristor, Cardispawn, Lord Rend, Wormy, Den of the Drake, McEatley, and Onya. Or with only five dollars more, you could become a Duke of Feathers. Like Elf, Repetitive Debug, Grunt, Craycard, Kive Mind, The School Bus, Quinn, Jarrett Sewer, Blues Otters, Doc Salty 96, Matthew Mulqueeny, and Acroth. And with all of that out of the way, 
I'll see you next time as the crow flies.